If we look at impacts, considering that's the, the focus of the talk this evening, um, this is just a, a global distribution of known impacts stolen from an Earth Impact database online and Fredefort somewhere around there. So it seems like much of northern South America and Central Africa has not been impacted. Um, also the wastes of Siberia, um, apart from one that was publicized recently, haven't had many impacts. Um, that could be that they're underexplored, um, they're eroded, so very little preservation. Um, I have it on good evidence from Roger that Fredefort has been eroded by about 10 kilometers since, uh, since the date of impact. So that puts it in good perspective. Next. Okay, so why Fredefort? Um, if we look at other test sites, aerial test sites for geophysical systems, there's one at Henty's in Namibia, which is used for radiometric calibration. It's quite a process to go about establishing a calibration site for radiometric certain criteria that need to be met. Um, one was established as part of the countrywide survey in Nigeria a good few years ago now um, under the leadership of Fugro and the coring gravity gradiometry test site in Australia. It's about 60 kilometers outside of Perth. Um, there's obvious downsides to having very sparsely located test sites, um, especially for radiometric calibration. Uh, I think I'll note later in the talk that calibration on radiometric or at least airborne radiometric instruments is recommended at a, an annual interval, somewhere around 12 months. So you have to, every year, fly your system to Namibia, spend a week or two to get favorable conditions, and test it and calibrate it. So it's, it's quite a job. The logistics around it are non-insignificant. Um, to do the same thing with a gravity gradiometry system, you'd have to go to Australia. That's a little bit more out of the way. Uh, generally, our aircraft that we fly geophysical instruments in don't like crossing big oceans like that. Um, they don't do well. Maybe we should uh, look at amphibious aircraft in future. Or we can establish a test site here at home. So that's one of the reasons. So some considerations around why Fredefort. So there's logistical considerations. There's geography. There's the geology, obviously. And we like to consider the geophysics as well. So the little stars on the map are airports or strips um, where one could mobilize at least airborne geophysical systems out of. And this is Fredefort slap bang in the middle. So that's not a problem. Over here is the uh, Vol Dam. So that could be useful as a zero background. Um, I'm not aware that it's ever been investigated. Um, obviously, there's temporal variations in the radon concentrations, but it is a possible point where one could get a calibration value. Edgar seems to not believe me. We have done that. <laughs> Sure. Uh, 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 the question. Okay, so the biodiversity of the area. This is part of the Fredefort Dome Heritage Site, World Heritage Site, which was established in 2005. Um, quite a large area around the, the site. All of the land is currently privately owned, and it covers about 40,000 hectares. Um, some examples of archaeological sites and Type two, group two sites, um, which have been investigated in the area. This is the Free State, so that's the World Heritage Site right on the border. Uh, quite a few different biomes represented within the site, and the Fredefort Dome granitic grassland is unique. I don't, I'm not an expert on exactly how it's unique, but apparently it's unique. Um, <laughs> In terms of uh, stress, um, river conservation status categories, um, just the rivers right in the southwest are not threatened. There's some vulnerable and endangered, and most of the riverine systems in the area are critically endangered. So this is a, certainly an ecological um, concern. 
but also an opportunity. Ah, just in terms of the anthropological and archaeological um, significance of the area, there are these sites. So, the geology, what is Freda Fort? Um, it used to be a volcano, now it's an impact. So these things change. Um, an impact, uh, probably they say the size of Table Mountain. Some people say it's uh, unknown origin or composition. Some websites quote it as chondritic in origin or composition. Um, about the size of Table Mountain impacted 2023, I think, plus or minus four or five million years ago. Uh, so just after the bushveld in geological terms and left a crater, the inner ring, about 100 kilometers in diameter. The entire structure and, and sort of distortion of the upper crust went out to possibly as far as 300 kilometers in diameter. Um, there's a really short video clip, and if all works well, you'll be able to hear the sound as well. Imagine Freerefort 2,000 million years ago. Scientists say it was probably a shallow, lifeless lake covering stacked layers of rock, just like a sandwich. On top was the Transvaal Supergroup, a compilation of sedimentary rock types such as dolomite. Volcanic fenderstock lavas formed the second layer. The Bitwaters Run Supergroup, with conglomerates containing gold, made up the third layer. Granite was at the bottom end of this geological sandwich. Imagine a meteorite the size of Table Mountain traveling at 20 kilometers per second. Well, this massive object struck Freda Fort Dome and destroyed all forms of life. The impact, or first phase, created a massive dent in the earth. The second phase was an immediate rebound that brought the deepest rock layers to the surface. Lastly, erosion set in, and over millions of years, many crater-like features had been weathered away. Okay. So... That rim, just after the impact, could possibly have been as high as 15 kilometers. Um, obviously, significant erosion to this point, uh, exposing the core, the granite. So you can now see all the different stratigraphic layers exposed at the surface. Um, certainly an advantageous target for large-scale geophysical investigation. Um, do you want to come and give your bit? Janine being from the council. Um. Okay, so um, my job here today is just to say the Council for Geosciences perspective on the Freerefort as a geophysical test site. And just, um, it's very boring because there's not really pictures, so I apologize in advance, in advance. So the council is mandated by the Geoscience Act of um, 100 of 1993 um, and also in 20, 2010, it was amended by the Amendment Act 16. And of importance um, to us here is um, the, one of the functions of the Council sorry, is to develop and maintain national geophysical test sites. It was in the original Act and also in the Amendment Act where they added some other things, but the development and maintenance of, of, of geophysical test sites remain there. So that is basically what we are mandated to do. We're supposed to do it, um, and this is where we see our role here, is to do what we're supposed to do, basically. Um, so in our view, to develop and maintain an airborne geophysical test site, we need to do the following. It's very simple from our perspective. We have to collect and make available a um, wide quality ground geophysical data so that you can compare your airborne geophysical data to that. You can do draw borals and do wireline logging for control. Um, and then we also have to make sure that the data and 
information about the test sites available out there um, to anybody who needs to access it. And, uh, and of course you have to liaise with local government departments and things like nature conservation and local communities. And at the council we have a stakeholder management um, department that focuses on this and um, they go and um, talk to the local communities and people um, to get us access to it. So that is where we have a role to play. In terms of the data that um, we know is available over the Frida Fort, um, CGG had some gravity data that they're willing to contribute. Um, there's the old MIDAS data that apparently is in CGG's position. Um, we also approached um, GyroLag, but they, they have a, a test line, but they feel it will not be um, valuable to the project. Then Geotech has some data, helicopter gravity and magnetic and, and um, EM. Spectrum <coughs> Air was, I think they surveyed, or they were, they were going to survey or something. I haven't surveyed yet. Okay. And then there's Falcon AGG data that we cannot get access to. Um, mm -hmm. And then from our side, from the non-commercial side basically, from VETS, um, they went to the trouble of um, entering all the gravity data from Step that Duncan Steptoe did for his PhD. So that is now in digital form, but it must now be linked in with the other data that we have. And we have, of course, all our um, available regional gravity and magnetic data and geological data. At the moment, we haven't received any of these data sets. We've had commitments from people, but so far we haven't received any data. Um, and then the other point where I think in terms of data management, I looked at this current airborne gravity test site web page and it's actually, it's quite simple, but I think it's effective where you just have an overview location and you you provide the data sets on that web platform. Um, how, how we're planning, I mean, that's from our perspective, it can be quite simple. I don't know if there needs to be a, a more complicated way. Um, they have, for example, they show the data sets that they have and you can download it. It's like a, I call it a package, so it's not on this. But, and then they have the different data sets that they have collected and people have um, given to them. So <coughs> basically that is my whole story, very short and very few pictures. <laughs> it's okay, Janine, I brought the pictures. Um, okay, there you go, everything's working like it should. So, as Ria couldn't be here tonight, um, considering they have proposed a significant participation in the project. Um, she was kind enough to submit a few slides on Geosoft's proposal. So just about Geosoft, they're a global company founded in 1986. They provide geoscience uh, processing, data management, data portals, all sorts of wonderful earth modeling um, technologies. So this is something like what may be proposed for the Fred de Fort um, test site portal. Um, so collating and, and distributing the available data to public and private sectors. This is an example of a Geosoft DAP server environment where various data are loaded into it. Um, there's two different options that they have put forward. Either we could host the data on their existing DAP portal, which is a, a essentially a global database. Um, at little or no cost to the initiative. The alternative would be setting up a bespoke Fred Fort test site data portal, uh, in which case it would attract initial and ongoing costs. So their approach to data management, um, we would go through a process of reviewing the data, auditing it, cleansing it, organizing it. Um, put it into various different types of repositories based on the physical nature of the, the data, be it geophysical, geochemical. You see we have significant drilling and geological observations within the Fred Fort area. So a very rich and multi-physical model could be uh, developed around these data. Land tenement being one of those <laughs> issues that was raised by Solomon 
earlier. Um, and then finally deploying that data in a portal that's easily consumable by the end user. They've got a couple of examples of data portals that they have done uh, for the Botswana Geological Survey. Um, they've got airborne geophysical data covering the whole country and at various resolutions. They've got ground geophysical data. They have geochemical sampling assay data um, and grids of that. There's remote sensing for groundwater investigations, Landsat. There's seismic data uh, just in terms of natural seismic events. And full 3D models can also be hosted and delivered in a portal like this. So quite rich, quite capable and ties into many of the enterprise level software platforms that geoscientists of today make use of. Um, Geosoft has also received a commitment from Canadian Microgravity and Geotech that their data will be made available free of charge to the initiative. Um, this data was acquired in 2009 it's GT2A airborne gravity, uh, flown in an Excalibur aircraft, a kilometer line spacing, 15 kilometer tie lines. Um, there's Excalibur radiometric and magnetic data as well. And on the geotech side, um, their survey that they did, it's uh, northwest, southeast trending lines. It was about 70 kilometers long, nine lines. It's about five, uh, sorry, the traverses were at 500 meter line spacing. So that's ZTEM data and GT2A data and they have reaffirmed to me this morning that the data will be transferred to us via FTP shortly. So that's wonderful news, um, certainly a, a fantastic data set over a large scale structure which ties in quite nicely with the capabilities of ZTEM as we know it. Okay, so at a large scale can't really see the contrast too well on this, but essentially there's the, the ring of the Fredefort structure, um, a very, well, moderately detailed geological map showing the granites in the middle, um, the Vitz, the Fentersdorp, and these blue rocks forming the Transvaal, Dolomites, etc. on the outside. So large-scale geophysics corresponding to that, um, Maybe this is a little bit more large scale than what I've shown there, but there were various studies done throughout the 2000s um, into the 2010s. This being um, a seismic tomographic experiment done as part of the Africa Array project and a quite a vast array, what used to be the largest MT collection uh, to date. Um, that I think has been surpassed by Australian data sets now in the search for geothermal targets. But a significant amount of work done by fairly large international uh, collaborations on these data. So just by having these data, significant um, exposure has been derived for the science. Um, a lot of funding has been generated. A lot of science has been done as a result of these. So if we go in a little bit closer, um, some of you may not know what that is, but it's a pseudotachylite. Um, the black stuff in the middle is the same composition as on the outside. This is a granitic or grano... Roger? Grano... fire? Something? Grano diuretic. Um, so essentially the same composition but a melt. So when the impactor struck the ground, it melted some of the rock and that squished around and you end up with a frozen uh, rock that looks like that. So there's corresponding fairly detailed geological mapping done at that scale as well. We understand the structure really, really well. So if we go into a little bit closer, um, this is the plan of the data that Duncan acquired. Um, Duncan, what's the vintage on this? 1970, sure. Okay, so it's uh, recently had a new lease on life. That's Lou, for those of you who don't recognize him. 
and late at night, um, digitizing said data, burning the midnight oil. So he's done the initiative uh, a service. Similar scales, there's the um, airborne magnetic data that was acquired some time back. Um, Corner et al. proposed that this subtle low running around there was due to pre-existing mid-crustal uh, magnetite layers. Hart then in 1995 and Henkel and Reimolt 1998 modeled the anomaly as a uniform layer of thermally remagnetized Archean granite that extended from surface essentially to the depths of four and a half kilometers. Um, these quite intense lows that you see around the outside of the visible crater correspond to what possibly were remagnetized shales of the West Rand group. Um, I think the jury's out or possibly in after Roger Hart did some work on the um, remnant magnetization down quite deep core samples. I think the, the samples went down to about 10 meters. Uh, and they showed variation from surface down. And their hypothesis was that the remagnetization was due to lightning strikes and not as a result of the impact. Anyway, interesting. Again, similar scale data. This is gravity data um, acquired at a one kilometer line spacing from the council and GT2 data that was acquired, as I said, in 2009. This is the geotech data. So you've got the Bouguet, Bouguet gravity anomaly data in the top left, the TMR top right, the total phase rotated in phase 600 hertz on the bottom left, and the total phase rotated in phase 25 hertz. So that's a fairly low frequency, um, pretty much as low as controlled source systems would go. Um, the new controlled source systems, at least the airborne ones, are going a little bit lower. Um, but you can see fairly good correlation with the large scale structure as we know it. So Janine mentioned Falcon as well. Falcon data was acquired over Fredefort. Uh, also at a one kilometer line spacing. Um, there's been some reluctance for this initiative to get hold of the data. CGG said that they don't think that it is commercially viable for them to make the data available to the initiative. Um, I would say that they made the data available to the Colorado School of Mines, to a bunch of other authors that have processed and published these data. Um, Mark Dransfield from 2009 being, uh, I believe, the first. Um, but significant work has been done on interpreting the tensor gravity gradiometry data um, using all sorts of methods, eigenvector analyses. So again, just having these data has spurred significant research into how to make use of it, how to derive more value from it. Um, the paper by Paoletti et al. in 2016 asking the question of whether the inversion of the data provides better resolution. I'm not going to comment on whether I agree or disagree with them, but you know those are the questions that are asked as a result of having these data to work with. And then going down to a much smaller scale. So this image is, well, that little strip there is 20 micrometers. Um, that little strip there is about 10 micrometers. And even at these scales, you see clear evidence of that shock that was induced by the impact. Um, the beautiful little conjugate joint sets in mineral grains. Um, and this analysis has not been done in a restricted area. It's been done on a significant portion of the exposed dome. Uh, data that would be closer to the scale, not quite at that scale, but closer. Um, I've whitened the data out, so you can't see it. But essentially, that's the extent of the Midas um, magnetic gradiometry data that was acquired by Fugro, I believe. No, it would have been Geodas at that stage. 
um, 50 meter line spacing MIDAS data. So it's exceptional data. It shows wonderful features, and we certainly need to get our hands on it. Um, they, or they, Anglo has not expressed that they won't provide the data. They just don't have it right now. <laughs> um, so going to the um, slightly smaller scale, looking at paleo mag studies that have been done. Again, they drilled two boreholes. I think they were separated by five meters, 10 meters deep, looking at the variation in the paleomagnetic um, response in the rock from depth down. And then looking at that same paleomagnetic information in the melt rocks, which were obviously um, altered and reset at the time of the impact. And they show various correlations. But anyway, this, this work has been done. We know a lot about the geology of Fredefort. Janine again touched on um, the coring test site. So they've got a nice website. They make some data available. And a lot of work has been done on this data. So uh, even Geosoft has published 2016 uh, various types of inversion that was done with the AGG data. This AGG data, I believe, was the Falcon data as well. So they were comparing conventional AGG inversion versus joint inversion using the ground data as well as the AGG data. Now, these are features that are fairly close to surface. Um, the scale escapes me right now, but you know these are within tens of meters um, from the surface. So you'd expect that the AGD, AGG data would give you the right answer, that it wouldn't be missing the long wavelength information um, because these causa causal bodies are very close to surface. But even integrating the ground gravity data as a joint inversion has made a difference. Um, and again, without these data, these sorts of studies and these realizations wouldn't have manifested. Um, Voxy has, well, this is really a, a 3D view of the Voxy inversion that, that Geosoft ran on the data. These little black dots that you see in this image in the center are points, survey points from the ground data. So they've done ground gravity at varying resolutions out from the center of this anomaly. Um, the downside, I think, to the coring test site, other than it being in Australia, is that they don't know anything about the geology. It's just a geophysical anomaly. So they're comparing the quality of the aerial anomaly to that acquired on the ground. And even that has derived much in the way of aerial gravity gradiometry processing and ability to estimate noise in the data. Uh, that's just a front cover from the Nigerian calibration facility. So you saw the same um, table in Janine's presentation. I think we, we need to redouble our efforts to get hold of that Falcon data. Um, it certainly is quite a comprehensive data set. It covers most of the structure. Geotech, as I, as I mentioned, has reaffirmed that they will make their data available to us shortly. Um, Excalibur's committed their gravity and radiometric and mag data. Um, Anglo-American, I'm fairly sure that we'll be able to get our hands on that. We just need to convince the right people. Um, Spectrum has indicated that they will be acquiring Spectrum EM data in Q4 2018, so end of this year, and that that data will be made, will be made available straight away for free. Um, they will also be acquiring squid airborne mag data, mag tensor data. And that will not be made available immediately, but hopefully by Q2 2019, so halfway through next year. Other than what was on Janine's slides, uh, there is the Africa Array data, the Samtex data, the magnetotelluric and seismic data. There's all the cores that still will surely provide a wealth of research opportunities. So now that we've got the logistics down, the geography down, the geology, the geophysics, what else? Why do we want a test site at Fredefort? 
So this is the Fred Fort Dome Conservancy Strategic Development and Management Plan 2002. And I've highlighted a few important things here. So one of their obligations is conserving and promoting the geological significance and scientific value of the Fred Fort Dome structure and its archaeological, historical and natural assets, uh, fully capitalizing on the unique geology, international interest and tourism values of the area. Those are pretty powerful statements. Um, they're mandated to do that. And we should take the opportunity to help them do that. Their key objectives, uh, to protect in perpetuity a representative sample of the unique geological phenomenon of the Fred Fort Dome impact structure, and to allow opportunities for related research. To generally conserve, promote, optimally interpret the area's unique geology, the system's biodiversity, abiotic resources, biophysical processes, unique landscape and cultural heritage. I don't think we'll go too, much, too far into the cultural heritage, but who knows, maybe some GPR investigations of archaeological sites could be on the cards. Um, I don't think we should limit this to an airborne test site. So dating back to around 2016 sometime, um, there were a number of suggestions that started to arise that we run competitions, that we generate a revenue through possibly data access fees, that we bolster geotourism as a result of the geophysical and geological investigations that are done here. There was also a bunch of equipment. I don't know whether that equipment's still available, Chris, too, um, or whether it somehow got onto Dr. Faree's train. Um, education, so Geosoft could include these data sets in training modules, um, facilitating lecturing and, and teaching and fixing ground traverse positions. So we need work done on the ground, boots on the ground, to, to get this to the point where it's a rigorous test site. And to make it easy for companies to get in there and test their equipment. That's the whole point, that we foster uh, the development of new equipment, new methods at the site, at this locale. It's not just getting the data and making it available to a global audience. It's to bring that global audience here. So, Christu, see his name at the bottom there, um, successfully got the data policy approved, specifically around the Fredefort area. So this is um, reaffirming that the council would make those data available for research purposes. We had the Fredefort discussion panel session at Saga 2017, which again just reinvigorated discussion around this, unfortunately with the conference being in the Cape and Fred Fort being up here, um, and never the two shall meet, the field trip unfortunately didn't happen at that stage. However, we did indicate that we would like to run that field trip uh, at some time in the future. And the man who would lead the field trip is sitting at the back of the room, so certainly a good opportunity to generate some excitement and interest around that. So what are the other opportunities? Um, this is where Sue was going to give her a little bit, but she hasn't unfortunately made it yet. Um, I mentioned the radiometric calibration. Edgar can, can have his say in a, a minute or two about that. Um, but it's closer than Henty's. Um, is it usable? Is it an opportunity to pursue? I'm not going to say it is or isn't, but the opportunity is there. So we were just brainstorming and looking around other opportunities that could coalesce if we developed a test site. Quite a big question, the elephant in the room is, what's the value of geophysics? I mean, geophysics is an industry. There's a lot of um, related disciplines that appreciate the value. But are we missing a trick? Um, in our meeting a little bit earlier, uh, it was indicated that this has been tried before to get, for example, 3D seismics uh, listed as part of a JORC compliant process that one would go through to, to define a resource and a reserve and list that on a stock exchange or canvas for investment. Um, should we be looking at incorporating mandatory geophysical surveys as part of the process of registering resources and reserves. If we do, 
it's going to require a lot of work. Um, it's possibly going to put a whole bunch of people out of work uh, because they won't hit the mark. But it will also require a lot of rigor. Um, there's a lot of certainty that comes with drilling a borehole. There's a lot of uncertainty with geophysical methods. And I think it's really around quantifying that uncertainty and being able to go to an engineer and saying, we think it's this, but we're possibly this wrong. And we're not good, we're not comfortable with doing that. We're getting better, but we're not there yet. The other thing is the pre preventative or de-risking applications. So there was some talk around, um, or post the Lily Mine disaster, around how geophysics can be used in risk and disaster management. Uh, where can we add value? Is it just locating possibly trapped miners, or is it in quantifying the risk of going into an area? Can you quantify the ground stability so rescue teams can get in and work safely? So there's huge avenues for business around this. As Solomon said, I'll echo his words, business is about making money. So can we save lives around doing this? Can we make more money by doing this? Yes. If it's developed to a test site, there'll be data standards that need to be set, um, ideally in collaboration with the council. Is there interest for the uh, deep drilling program? I mean, Freda Fort's a pretty big structure. It disturbs most of the upper crust. Um, this was a question, I suppose, at one stage, I think, We've put that question to bed now after the collaboration at Saga 2017. Um, geophysics doesn't need any more endorsement at the council. Uh, they're certainly an advocate and in our corner. ITAR restrictions, there should not be any ITAR restrictions on the use of the Falcon data at Fredafort, um, considering it's been published by a number of international uh, institutes. This is an interesting one. So. DST, DTR, these SEZs, I don't know if everyone knows what an SEZ is, a special economic zone. So it's essentially an area geographically isolated, ring fenced, virtually, physically, um, where certain benefits are afforded to companies which operate in that area. So they're tax free havens, for example. Um, I don't know if the innovation hub is formally an SEZ in terms of tax legislation, but it's an attempt at putting like-minded individuals or companies in the same area to allow them to cross-pollinate and innovate more rapidly. So I'll use an example here, where's the value? So CGG, beginning of last year, closed their operations in South, in South Africa. They had Geodas here from 1980 something, a long time ago at least. Um, that was bought by Fugger, that was bought by CGG, and there was essentially no draw card for them to keep their business here. They developed new geophysical technologies, they employed a bunch of technicians, engineers, geophysicists in the industry, and they closed up shop and left. That was a significant part of our industry that just closed and disappeared. Part of that was the South African CAA and the cumbersome requirements that they place on operating uh, aircraft. So they took their business to Australia. Um, are there opportun opportunities to get other universities involved? Geosoft has expressed their interest um, in providing some form of data portal uh, or getting these data onto their existing data portal, so that's also significant. And then just a list of other ideas around single Earth multi-physical models. So we've got all these electromagnetic passive EM. I'm sure there's some 3D seismic data from gold fields, or you mentioned Anglo Gold Ashanti might have some legacy. Uh, yep. So there was a whole analysis team that was put together to look at the Vitz Basin, how Fredafort impacted that the Vitz Basin, the preservation potential of the gold being changed by the impact of the Fred Fort meteor. Um, structural mapping has been done, but there's always more opportunities for research projects. Groundwater is an interesting one. So 
it's uh, a hot topic. I got an email yesterday morning while there was a deluge outside from Greenpeace saying that we were in a, a dire critical situation and water, water scarcity in South Africa. And I had to sort of chuckle to myself looking out the window. <laughs> I thought, you know, Joburg's above Cape Town. Can't we build a pipeline that goes downhill? Um, so groundwater, um, food security. What about agri-geophysics? Laurent's quite a, an advocate for the use of ultra high resolution geophysical methods in precision farming. Um, being in the free state, you're probably in the right area to test equipment, to test new methods. Um, temporal change related to groundwater and aquifers, etc. So you've probably got a, a lot of groundwater monitoring boreholes in the area. Good opportunity to calibrate and test equipment that would be used for groundwater tests. I know there was some talk around that earlier. Um, Self-demagnetization, I don't think we're in that realm. I don't think any of the stuff is quite uh, magnetic enough. But there's certainly some interesting studies that have been done on the remnant magnetization of those strata and how it's been changed, how it's been altered by lightning, etc. Um, I know a lot of it was done through the Shonlin Institute and we should continue collaboration with them on that. The seismic and MT, so involving Lonman, Goldfields, etc., in the data collaboration. Joint interpretation with mine seismicity. So there's these 3D monitoring sensors that are placed all around that area. Uh, certainly Coltonville, uh, Bitbank, uh, Dalcom. Um, so we've got a pretty good understanding of how the ground's moving around there. This was an interesting opportunity that I uh, became aware of, and I've actually collaborated with Musa on, is the liberation of um, gas from the Vits, and whether it's biogenic gas or not, and how the Fredefort impact fractured the reservoir, allowing this gas to percolate to the surface. So there's at least one company now that's commercially producing gas from the Vits. I was stunned. I had never put two and two together. Now, Moose's team um, was studying methane buildup in the Vits using 3D seismic data. So these opportunities, you know, there's certainly potential for cross-pollination and collaboration between industries like this that have just charged ahead and they're making money out of it and academic and research initiatives. Um, I think that was Sue's one, MT line to link deep shell gas boreholes. Um, MT was tried in this area. Unfortunately, there's a lot of cultural noise due to the train lines and all sorts of things around the area. MT doesn't like that much. The Witz Field School, a fantastic opportunity that goes back there every year to start tying in these very disparate data sets to filling in the holes in our, our coverage. Another opportunity is tying the Falcon with the ground gravity data. So you can take the Falcon. This is the one avenue I pursued to try and get the, the gravity data out of CGG is to say, well, don't give us the Falcon data. Give us a downward continued computed vertical component of the gravity data at ground level resampled to the ground gravity stations to fill in all the holes. I didn't fall for that one either. Um, <laughs> and squid studies. So, uh, you know, De Beers, Anglo have this wonderful machine. Um, there's a couple of other companies that make use of slightly different squids. This is a wonderful test site. There's a few others, but we know a lot here. We have a lot of other comparative data here. So if we can increase the confidence in these data, start tying them together, start doing some research on, on how we can uh, motivate the development of the industry around this. And then funding sources, so the NRF, the council, I'm sure the council can be squeezed for a bit more. There's Thrip, um, Thrip and SPI or SPI. Uh, they are two initiatives through the Department of Trade and Industry, and they provide funding specifically for commercializable projects, so commercializable ready technologies. If you come with an idea, you've done all the background research, uh, you've got a, a co proof of concept essentially, they will provide funding in the millions of rands to projects to get it on the table to see some benefit from the implementation of the technology. 
So these things are there and we need to tap into it. Um, there's also significant gearing ratios there. So I think some of these are like nine to one. So if you put in 10 Rand, they'll give you 90 in exchange. So what do we need to do? Um, just to wrap up, like there's all of this data, there's all of these ideas, but we need a clear focus. We need a scope for how the different parties, the different stakeholders are going to collaborate in this and who's going to bring what to the table. Um, that's my piece.